Hi, everybody, and welcome back to What's Your Wrangle. I'm your host, Jennifer Shannon, and we are thrilled to invite you back to season two, where we're going to be talking about some of the great things happening as part of an innovation framework. And I can think of no better place to start today than with machine learning and AI and demystifying that for you. And I'm welcoming you today to have this discussion with me with two of the experts at Wrangle. I'd like to introduce you to Jan Schultz and Dave McDonald. Welcome, folks. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Yeah, <laughs> We're glad to have you here. Why don't we start off a little bit, and maybe I'll start with you, Jan. Just uh, tell me a little bit about your background and tell me about uh, how you came to Wrangle and what are some of the things you're working on here at Wrangle. Um, yeah, I uh, I'm joined Wrangle here as Director of uh, Artificial Intelligence, um, trying to build up the AI team here. Uh, and really teaching all at Wrangle, uh, all people at Wrangle about AI, and letting them participate in it. Um, originally, I come from academia, like many data scientists out there, um, uh, where I studied neuroscience and uh, applied machine learning techniques to uh, medical imaging data, uh, and that's where I picked up that skill. Um, but what I realized in academia, it's really hard to bring projects to conclusion because people are self-taught. They don't have that industry context of um, running through proje projects in an agile way. And uh, that's when I changed to industry to, to uh, learn all about um, developing successful projects. So a little bit of background then. <laughs> How about you, Dave? Uh, so my background is uh, from industry. Um, so uh, I'm here with uh, Wrangle as a senior solution architect. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, I started a group called Toronto AI. Uh, it's just a meetup group. Uh, we have about 4,400 members at this point. Uh, and we do these uh, workshops, like the, how it got started was through workshops, uh, teaching TensorFlow uh, to small groups and then to progressively larger uh, and larger groups. Uh, and many of those uh, events have been hosted here at Wrangle. Uh, they, they have a great machine learning uh, team uh, present here at Wrangle. So listen, there's a lot of information, and I'm going to say it, excitement out there about uh, machine learning and AI. But I'm going to ask the million dollar question. What is machine learning? What is artificial intelligence? Are they the same exact thing? Talk to me and demystify for me what exactly these are. And maybe Dave will start with you. Okay, so uh, w we might disagree slightly on this. Uh, and that's okay, that's okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, my understanding with machine learning is that it encompasses a wide range of techniques for training models to approximate, uh, to approximate uh, a, an objective. Yeah. Um, so that objective could be many different uh, things. It's with machine learning, you, the idea is that you define a, a, a task and then optimize towards that using experience based on data. Uh, so there's many approaches to doing that. More recently, there have been uh, neural nets. Um, they, they've been around for a long time, but uh, it's, it's only recently that they've been used so extensively since... Um, I, I would say probably around uh, the like the, the early part of this decade was when they really started to take off. And, and talk to me, what is a neural net? Just so, just in case you know there are people there that are looking for that sort of deep understanding. Yeah. So a neural net is essentially layers of uh, weights. Uh, it's a feed-forward directed acyclic graph. Um, that basically you feed data in one side and it goes through a series of transformations yeah. to the other side. Uh, and so ideally you want to uh, send in data that represents the information about the problem that you're trying to solve. And at the other side, you have output units that describe the solution that you want. And then you can take that through a, uh, an iterative process of what's called backpropagation, uh, to feedback error through the model to correct all of those weights. And there can be millions and millions of these weights within those layers uh, to create a better uh, approximation of that function that you're trying to model. Hmm. So if I was going to use an everyday example of that, you could say that um, if, I wanna, if I owned a restaurant and I was using AI to help me with ordering products or, or reducing my inventory of things going bad, as I could say, here's all of the people that are coming in every single week and the times that they came in and the things that they order and how much their bill was. And on the outside of it, I want to have a fundamental understanding of how much inventory or raw food product I need to have um, on a weekly basis based on that learning over time then that's how this could operate and solve that problem. 
Yeah, so that's actually a great use case for uh, neural nets. Uh, that, that's getting into uh, the area of forecasting. Um, so. Uh, Often what you want to do is uh, to extrapolate from existing data. Uh, and uh, if, if you have historical information, you can use that. So given past weeks of information, you can predict, uh, you can see what happened the following week uh, and then use that to build a model for uh, forecasting. So you would make it conditional on the information that, uh, that you have available. Um, which is pretty exceptional. Yes, that's pretty yeah, awesome, definitely. right? Yeah. So, Jan, maybe a different opinion, similar. Yeah. Um, great question. Um, currently, um, people in the business world throw around those uh, terms interchangeably: AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. They don't care. I think now in the industry, people settled on calling everything AI, and there's sort of an insider joke that even statistics, like linear regression, is now AI. Uh, which it really isn't, uh, but people call everything that is somehow remotely smart AI now. Uh, and to some degree, we have to talk about topics in that way. Um, but fundamentally, if you look at it, I think artificial intelligence is an umbrella term that includes machine learning, but also robotics, mm. expert systems, and other things as well. And then in machine learning, there are different machine learning techniques, one of which is to do with uh, neural networks called deep learning, but there are also things like random forest models that are not deep learning, but they fall under machine learning. So there's this hierarchy of uh, terms. Um, if you want to be very specific, but in Which the we do. <laughs> <laughs> in the industry, AI is uh, probably the the uh, the term that is used for most of it now. Um, what is uh, a neural network? Uh, just quickly, um, uh, you it's what what's in your head when you learn something. So if you think about uh, learning how to ride a bicycle, uh, you get on the bicycle and you fall over to the right side. Next time you try to avoid that by steering the bicycle to the right. And that's exactly how a neural network works. You have an, a difference between what you expect, you want to ride on your bicycle, and what is actually happening, you fall over. And in your head, you adjust your uh, motor response, your arm movement, and your your weight on the bike accordingly to avoid that mistake, and that's exactly what the fundamentals of training neural networks. So, million dollar question then: Why machine learning? Like, what is this the the case scenario for businesses to invest? Because let's let's be clear: it's it's a often an onerous and sort of expensive thing to invest in. So, why are businesses? investing in this? What, what is the use case scenario for machine learning or artificial intelligence in businesses using it to drive their business? And Dave, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. So uh, one of the areas that uh, I find can be pretty valuable for businesses is uh, to be able to provide uh, personalized experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that uh, an understanding of uh, the say, items to recommend on a page uh, to a particular user based off of uh, information that, uh, the, that is available uh, from prior interactions with that user, uh, that can go a long way to creating a better overall experience. Like By showing them better products, it's more likely that they'll get to the shopping cart. Uh, so that's, kind, that's an area that uh, can be very relevant in terms of being able to uh, s determine what type of inventory to stock shelves. Um, again, that's getting into forecasting, uh, predicting demand, all of that ties into uh, AI or ML-based techniques. So we're talking about a fundamental reduction in overall costs or inventory carrying charges or um, out of stocks or, you know, uh, markdowns as an example for, for retail if we're talking about that. But also more so that if I think about some of the work that Wrangle is doing with, with healthcare as an example and fundamentally understanding the needs of patients as an example and, and what they require across geos or across different diseases, et cetera, that I know that machine learning is, is helping some of those industries in using predict, predictive technology to create solutions. Maybe you could talk to me a little bit about that, Jan. Um, yeah, I think um, there's a bit of a misconception that we think of AI as uh, an um, expensive or difficult um, uh, problem or a difficult thing to implement. I think we should think uh, here at Wrangle, we think about artificial intelligence in terms of smart experiences and automating things. Uh, and it's really not that much different from any kind of uh, the other product development we do here, uh, for example, front ends. For, um, 
uh, we want to identify the the pain point that is in the industry, for example, in healthcare or in retail. Uh, and we are using all our um, uh, skills here at Wrangle uh, to build the right solution, part of which could be AI. Uh, and uh, we're using AI to provide a better user experience. So as an example for a retail industry, they might want to uh, be better at predicting what customers are interested in. As an example for the um, healthcare industry, they want to know uh, which patient to uh, treat first in a triaging situation. Uh, but that doesn't that solution doesn't only rely on uh, the AI part, it also relies on who is looking at the output of the AI. Um, very important component. So uh, here at Wrangle, we don't try to sell AI as a separate a la carte thing. Um, we don't sell you know two units of front end and one unit of AI. <laughs> It's really part of a whole solution because we have to take the user or the patient in the healthcare system uh, into account. What do they need? What do they want? Uh, and that's how we build the solution. So something that you've both alluded to in, in, in your answers is the integral relationship to data as part of this. So talk to me about the relationship of data to machine learning and, and what that, you know, what that fuel or that you know a machine needs in order to give the right outputs as you said earlier so again uh, uh, a misconception uh, okay. that we want to dissuade here uh, we a lot of um, uh, organizations that want to invest into AI uh, get stuck at the first step is they're asking themselves do we have enough data uh, do we have clean data and until they can answer that question with yes, they are not going to do the AI part. Uh, and I think that's turning things uh, upside down because, again, it's important who looks at the AI in the end. Is that useful? Is that output useful? And we want to get to that point very quickly so we get the feedback from the users in the end. Um, so here... Uh, at Wrangle, we are trying to uh, come up with solutions to maybe simulate data or get data from a public data source uh, or get third-party data um, or use whatever little data is available to start the machine learning uh, modeling process uh, and then get that feedback from the user of that machine learning model very quickly. And that will help us to inform actually the data acquisition process. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, rather than spending years and years, as some companies do, on collecting data, we want to get started very quickly on building the machine learning model um, because that teaches us a lot about what data we should collect in the first place. Usually what happens in these situations when people spend a lot of time on collecting data and cleaning data is later on when they start modeling the data, they find out uh, that the data is the wrong kind of data. So that uh, brings us uh, to the other side of the spectrum, which is, all of these major institutions, like healthcare institutions or banks, as an example, uh, or even retailers or legacy companies, they have this huge historical lake of data. Is there any sort of requirements to implementing machine learning or AI within an organization? Can you, How do you bridge that gap between the old data and the new data? And is there any requirements from companies to make that step? Or is that something that you're working with companies to solve? Um, yeah, that's uh, it's a it's a great question um, because a lot of large organizations are sitting on a huge pile of historic data, uh, and they feel there's some value in there, and there should be a way to monetize or make that data available for for the business. Um, and at the same time, they're continuing to collect uh, more and more data uh, through their uh, business processes. Um, I think. Again, uh, there are two worlds here. There's a big data um, AI world uh, that looks at large historic data sets such as uh, customer data, uh, sales data, um, um, supply chain data, mm -hmm. and then uses that data to forecast uh, certain KPIs into the future, uh, predict churn, uh, cr uh, predict cross-sell or upsell opportunities, uh, and so on and so on. The other side of the coin, which I find more interesting, is uh, than you know, um, uh, crawling through old heaps of data. Basically, is designing uh, solutions that produce their own data. A good example is, um, uh, for example, uh, autonomous cars. They are on the street collecting their own data, 
which I find amazing. So any mistake that one car makes will then be fed into the AI to train it so that in the future no car makes that mistake again. Um, so I think we should think uh, in, in terms, uh, we, we should think about AI solutions uh, and applications in a way that they collect their own data to become smarter, adapt to new circumstances, improve, provide better experiences. Um, so that's that's a really interesting thing. So let's say the business has now said, okay, we, we need to invest in this, this propensity model that we want to do or, or the modeling of our business that we want to do moving forward. Um, they would either invest in it themselves or partner with someone like Wrangle in order to make this happen. So what is the key considerations for them at the outset on whether, one, they're going to do it themselves or, or partner with experts. What are those key considerations that they are thinking about? Or is there any consideration or is it just the, yeah, get started today and here's how? Um, yeah, organizations um, currently, despite the hype out there in the media, we there's no day where you can't uh, see an advert on TV about some new AI solution uh, by, by, the, uh, by large companies. Um, and, and their new uh, use cases coming out every day. Um, but despite all of all the hype, uh, actually uh, what is actually made uh, in reality, the AI solutions that are being developed right now, uh, it is quite, the market is quite slow still because fundamentally uh, organizations haven't understood yet the value that, can, that AI can provide and they haven't understood a process of building these solutions. Again, that's what I mentioned earlier, we have to think in terms of product development about AI. Uh, a lot of companies hire dedicated uh, data science scientist teams uh, from academia. Uh, these people don't have a background, usually don't have a background in project, project management or uh, in um, design thinking and all these things that help you create good products. Uh, so they are really f focused on working on what they're good at, analyzing data. But analyzing data and deriving insights doesn't create a product that the organization can uh, um, manage and operate that is pr providing value, scale, scale yeah. provide value to the users and so on. So we need all of that around it. Currently it's sort of being reinvented again, but we know it. We know the best pr process of uh, identifying pain points in organizations. Mm -hmm. We know how to um, uh, think uh, about solution, solutioning, the double diamond. Uh, we th know uh, about the importance of um, being able to operate a solution uh, and to refine it, to derive analytics, to see if it's uh, doing what we are, uh, what we are required to, to do, and so on. Um, so we need to bring all of these capabilities in. Um, again, at Wrangle, we have all these capabilities, so it's sort of a very nice coincidence that we can bring in these skills and uh, really think about AI as solving a problem, another tool in our uh, toolbox. Yeah. Right. So invest for the purpose of utilizing, right? So instead of just investing for the purpose of collecting more data and providing additional insights, it's, well, how are you going to action those insights, right? So you mentioned earlier, Dave, that you were a part of a meetup, and Jan, I'm guessing that you have some peer networks locally as well. So talk to me about some of the projects that they're excited about or the things that they're working on or the way that you, sh you see machine learning in practice right now in, in not just this community, but even globally. Yeah, great question, uh, Jen. Um, there's a lot of uh, startups uh, that are centered around AI. Um, and uh, there's some really creative use of, of using AI. Uh, I remember in one of your meetups, uh, Dave, uh, there was a company that presented uh, a use of AI in a, in a more creative, generative manner. Um, do you remember that with where they design uh, logos and business cards? Yeah, uh, Andrew Martin, I think, was hosting that. So that, that was using a generative model uh, for creating, a, a bl I believe it was fonts. Yeah. Um, so th that, that's an interesting area um, in terms of uh, generative AI. That, that's an area that I've been kind of fond of myself. Uh, and we see that in a number of areas uh, in terms of uh, being able to generate, whether it's uh, music, uh, speech, video. Uh, those are those are those are all different uh, modalities uh, that you can train models to uh, to create in very realistic ways. So think of um, you go to uh, that company's website and you click a button and you get your own personalized, unique business card with its own font, with its own lo logo. 
uh, that would have taken you know a couple of hundred dollars to design previously uh, if you had asked a human yes uh, now it's um, you know you can design a million variations on on your business card for free almost and you alluded to something around music talk to me a little bit more, a little bit more about that that's interesting so in terms of music synthesis, uh, MuseNet is uh, a model that was recently released by OpenAI, um, and it's, I, I would check it out. They, they have a SoundCloud. Um, they've been using that to uh, essentially create uh, compositional pieces. Just think of um, being able to uh, explore the space of music uh, with a click of your uh, mouse. So you could say... Um, uh, you can ask the AI uh, to design you a, a classical version of a death metal song, for example. <laughs> How would that sound like? Yeah. Uh, and Iron Maiden in the in the key of Bach. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and it, some of them are actually quite compelling. And it's good to see that uh, traditionally we thought of AI automating the, the boring, tedious tasks. But now it's creeping closer to what we thought is exclusively the human domain, the crea creative domain. Uh, so we, we saw that with music. Uh, there's also interesting uh, uh, AI models that translate between different domains. So you could say, uh, for example, write a, uh, a script and then the AI would create a movie uh, corresponding to that script. Um, so we're going to see a lot more. And uh, I think there's an interesting development. So uh, you asked earlier, where's the field heading? Uh, I think one way, uh, one um, uh, one uh, way you where we could look at, um, to see where AI is going is the gaming industry. Ah. Uh, that's kind of surprising, but uh, if you look at modern uh, AAA gaming titles, then uh, they cost tens of millions of dollars. And why do they cost so much? Uh, because there are designers who have to design every single building in a virtual city. Uh, and that costs a lot of money. So now uh, they are investing a lot of money. The gaming industry invests into building AIs that can design these buildings and not in a boring way, not in a cookie cutter way. You just tell the AI, it need a brick house, uh, two levels, and it will design 20 different variations of it that make sense to us, uh, but they're all different. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, inspiration coming from that field, and I can't wait to see that in uh, uh, transitioning to, to other fields as well, out of the gaming industry. For sure, yeah. And that's, I think, where it gets really interesting for someone like me who is uh, in marketing as part of my career, which is is not just about personalizing for, for customers and experiences, but it is also, um, I, I came from uh, the book industry and I read an article recently that they took all of the novels that were, you know, put into the, the ether as, not, you know, just script. And they said, okay, write the perfect novel based on the books that most everybody reads. Yeah. And essentially they came up with like the key plot lines, like you can imagine where that went, right? But but it, it that becomes really interesting because then it's like, okay, well, if it can do that, then what else? Like if you take feedback from 30,000 doctors around the world about the way that they've been treating certain scenarios or certain patient outcomes, and all of a sudden it outputs that this has been the most effective, start there, you're talking about chopping off a big chunk of time that equals someone's life, as you alluded to earlier. Um, if I asked you what kinds of businesses you think are, are um, going to be the most successful in the short term with AI and in sort of adopting, or machine learning rather, in adopting this, what kinds of industries do you think have the most to gain in the short term? So I would say uh, e-commerce is definitely well positioned for uh, benefiting from AI in terms of being able to uh, access uh, better product recommendations and uh, more personalized user experiences. Um, that's uh, the, that that translates just directly into uh, more revenue uh, for for these clients. Being up also. A B test or uh, going further than that into multi arm bandit testing uh, and further into reinforcement learning uh, and AI. That is a uh, that's definitely a an area that can be used to um, determine what to show a user uh, that's visiting a site and to learn from the population what is most effective. So uh, on one hand, there's personalization. On the other hand, it's like, okay, well, we could present the site in one of many different ways. Uh, which, which approach results in the best conversion? Uh, what maximizes uh, the, 
the, the what ends up in uh, the the checkout cart, mm -hmm. right? So um, those are all optimization problems that e-commerce can definitely benefit from. And if we're going to talk about e-commerce, we're also talking about the consumer, right? So yeah. every now and again, I like to throw something in my cart on Amazon that is just like completely out there, right? Like a harmonica on a necklace or something, right? But what I do appreciate is with a lot of clutter out there, right? Digital clutter, the curation is a benefit to me. So Absolutely. if I'm if I'm shopping at a retailer and you know that I've been there three times in the last three weeks and you know exactly what I bought, could you surface some contextual suggestions that all the other people who have buy these kinds of things would also like. So aside from e-commerce or, you know, what else, what other industry, Jan, do you see really benefiting from this in the short term? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a topic we have discussed internally a lot. Uh, what industries uh, should we talk to? Right. Um, who has a need? Um, and where is their... Uh, uh, where is the, the success here? Um, and I think the the best way of answering it is everybody can benefit from AI. Uh, I think AI is not particularly good for a particular industry. It it just can solve so many problems. Um, so I would answer that question with uh, the 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 organizations that are fast and nimble can profit the most. So um, again, we have digital native companies like Google and Amazon that have already invested heavily in AI. Um, but it's really the organizational structure of being able to build hundreds of models and run them and integrate them in their business that uh, helps them to take the advantage. It's not the particular industry they're in. Um, so uh, we see basically a split here. Um, small startups uh, are very good at leveraging AI yes. because they can build from the ground up the infrastructure and the organization around AI. Uh, and we have large uh, organizations that have the, the capital to invest into AI, but they haven't come around yet as an organization to uh, produce AIs. Gotcha. So the clients that you're currently working with um, as part of the AI team here or machine learning team, Talk to me about that onboarding process, that those initial conversations that you're having. Because I guess what I'm trying to get here is, is someone out there is listening to this conversation and they're saying to themselves, okay, this is really interesting. I definitely want to pursue this. So in those initial conversations that you're having with businesses, what is a part of that onboarding process? What is required of them as part of that? That's, that's a great question. Um, so having been in the industry for a while, uh, usually um, the clients are hesitant like that's the first thing so to people out there who are interested don't worry you know there's a process out there um uh that can help you get through this um so the first question is that that clients have is do i have enough data is my data clean and so on and as as we've talked about it be, um, before don't worry about that right. that we have ways to get third-party days uh, data uh, we have ways to have third-party data uh, we have ways to simulate data we can get around that. Uh, the next step is what is your pain point? Uh, again, we have techniques like value canvassing, design thinking to help you identify that pain point. And that is really a business pain point and not uh, a AI pain point because we want to build something that is ultimately of value to the organization. The next step is building a roadmap, um, sitting down, taking little steps, planning little steps as first, at first that get you to the final uh, big goal. Don't boil the ocean. A lot of right. people who jump into AI uh, sort of expecting uh, this as a one-time investment. Let's build this um, this broad AI thing and it's going to run our company and make us uh, rich and, and happy. <laughs> uh, well, that is the promise. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But yeah, that might be the blue sky uh, dream at this point, but don't try to do this as a first step. Uh, as a first step, find a little use case, work on that, get your data in order, uh, get your organization around. Um, you know, uh, if you're in a in a legacy industry, you probably have an IT department that uh, sits on the data, and then you have data scientists fighting with the IT department about the data and so on. So there are a lot of organizational things that have to be solved as well. Um, but with that roadmap, uh, we can give uh, confidence that you actually can achieve your goal in the future, uh, and. The beauty of it, all the rest will fall in place once you have solved these uh, problems first. So listen, you guys have been in this space for a while now, early adopters to the extreme. 
Dave, what are you excited about? What are you excited about in this space that you can see coming or like, what, what can you not wait to see happens here? So um, recently I just attended the iClear conference in New Orleans. Uh, and so that was a bit of a glimpse at the future. Uh, in terms of being able to see uh, intelligent agents able to uh, have very solid understanding of uh, Salesforce is doing some excellent work in this space. Actually, uh, they, they've uh, uh, they have an AI team that's been working on uh, developing state of the art systems for uh, understanding a document. So it's known as like question answering. Um, so the idea is that you can take a piece of text off the internet, then ask a question about it, and have the AI uh, provide the response. Uh, and so um, that was really fun to play with. Um, uh, also, getting into like uh, generative modeling, I find that to be uh, very fascinating. Um, that for industries that are uh, more creative, uh, creatively oriented, AI is going to play a big part um, going forward in the future in terms of being able to assist uh, artists uh, to uh, develop their work. Wow. Um, so, uh, creative studios uh, definitely could uh, benefit from from AI. And how is AI benefiting that community specifically? So. Um, being able to generate uh, new material um, at effectively no cost. Um, I, or, let me rephrase that. So um, being able to generate like novel new material uh, that is within a particular style, um, that, that can be very useful in terms of being able to explore ideas, uh, creating starting points uh, for developing uh, new creative content. Um, that's that's definitely one area, uh, and then in terms of reinforcement learning as well. Uh, I mean, there's been tons of work uh, in this space, basically to make these agents more and more capable to be able to learn off less and less data. Uh, so that eventually will tie into robotics. But uh, I mean, that's that's looking far into the future at this point. Yeah, but far into the future these days means like you know, 18 months from now. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least in in the way that we think about things in the tech community, right? Yeah. It's just really quickly. What about you, Jan? What are you excited about? Um, well, it's it's hard to to uh, as they say to make predictions, uh, especially when they concern the future. So we don't really know what the impact of AI will be. Um, I think there will be some surprises, um, and. Uh, whatever great AI will come out, I'm pretty sure we'll get used to it very quickly and it will be boring. <laughs> um, so, uh, but what I see is uh, quality of life. I, I, I think there's a huge potential um, and we are talking a lot about, about technology here uh, and um, maybe some uh, edge cases here, but really how does AI change the way we lead our daily lives? What do we do every day? Huh? We get out of bed, and then we have to put on the coffee machine. And AI could put on the coffee machine for us at the right time. Um, uh, then we get into our car. We're still driving a car. We need you circling around a block to find a parking space. AI could do that for us. That would help enormously. Uh, we then go to work. Uh, we have to shuffle around paper. We spend a lot of time searching for information. AI could help us with those boring, repetitive tasks. Yeah. So we can concentrate on the high value, the interesting, creative aspects. Uh, and you know, then we go, uh, go home uh, or we go out for drinks. Um, and everyone who goes out in a group knows the problem of finding a place that suits everyone. AI could help us there too. Um, so I think there will be a huge impact and um, our children or children's children will laugh at us that we never had that right. um, because it will become so natural. Right. They'll still have to change diapers like we do though. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to Dave and Jan for joining me today. It has been a pleasure talking to you. I really, really appreciate your insights. And thank you to all of you for joining us. As always, we love bringing you these insights on What's Your Wrangle. We'd love to get your feedback on what we've talked about today. And we'll certainly provide some contact information so you can connect with Jan and Dave as well after the show. So thanks so much for joining us. We hope you learned something just like we did today. Thank you again. And please do like and subscribe and uh, share with your friends. Thank you.